Our sermon text today will come from the Gospel of Matthew in the 13th chapter. We'll start in verse 44. Before we do, just a quick reminder, we're in a sermon series where we're going through the Gospel of Matthew, taking a look at every place where Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom of heaven, those words in particular, because we want to know uh, what is this hope that we're holding out for, this hope beyond the, the things that we see in this, in this side of life. What is this heaven? And Jesus teaches us about this. And today he teaches us in the form of a few parables. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 13 in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and he sold all that he had and he bought that field. The first thing I want to point out about this particular parable, um, well, let me just recap it briefly again. Jesus says there's this man, he's wandering through a field, and he stumbles upon a treasure, a great treasure. And uh, because he uh, is a, just an ordinary guy by every estimation that we have of the text, he, uh, this is a, a tremendous amount of wealth for him. So what he does is he, he can't just carry it off because then someone would know that there's a great treasure on that field that doesn't belong to him. So instead he puts it back in this hiding spot where he found it and then he runs off and he sells everything he owns so that he can afford to buy not the treasure but the field that the treasure was hidden in so that he may gain not the field but the treasure. Okay, that's the parable that Jesus tells. Now something I want to point out about, about this parable is that Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that treasure. Well, it's like that treasure in the extent that in this world now, it's sort of hidden from us. We stumble upon it sometimes, we catch glimpses of it, but, but for the most part, it's, we, what we see is this world that we live in, and, and heaven seems to be hidden from us. It's hard for us to imagine the extent of heaven's joy, because for right now, we can't see it all. C.S. Lewis, uh, in his book, the, From Miracles, he writes about what it's like describing heaven to someone, the joys of heaven. And he, he compares it to, comp to, to trying to explain the physical joys of, of an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife to a curious boy who's asking about sex and these sorts of things. And as the father explains this reality, he says that when a man and a woman are together, and it's the greatest physical experience that any human being can experience in this life. And, and the boy says, well, is there chocolate involved? <laughs> and the father says, no, there's not chocolate involved. And the boy can't understand how then can it be the greatest physical experience? Because the greatest thing he had, could ever experience at that point in time was chocolate. He can't imagine how anything could be greater than that. It was hidden from him, and it would be hidden until, you know, he hits puberty or gets married. It would be hidden from him. And in the same way, we talk about heaven and how its pleasures and its joys far exceed anything that we can imagine now. Our words don't do justice for it. And yet, that's what the Word of God tells us heaven is like. And it's so hard for us to, to give up chocolate, so to speak, to give up the pleasures of this world when, when we know that that we can't quite see what heaven will be like. We're just promised that it's amazing. That it's so, so much better than anything we can imagine. The scriptures describe heaven with the best words that they can, but even those fall short. The best words are things like this. Abraham's bosom. Heaven is like a hug, is what Jesus is essentially saying there. Or, or that heaven is, is pleasures forevermore. That's what the psalmist says. In many places in the Old and the New Testament, heaven is described as a feast. It's described by Jesus as paradise. It says that there, the scriptures tell us there will be no more tears there. And above all, it will be the very presence of God with his people. Unimaginable joy. Words can't, words can't come close to capturing what a wonderful place heaven will be. But the other part of this parable is, is that when we see that how joyful heaven is, it should generate a response in us. The, the scripture here tells us that from joy, this man goes and sells all that he has. From joy, he sells everything in order to obtain 
this treasure. It reminds us that the sacrifices we make in this life, the sacrifices of discipleship are really no sacrifices at all if we rightly understand what heaven is. Instead, those sacrifices are joy for us because they begin to enable us to experience the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. We can't ever get that completely now, but we draw closer and closer the more we sacrifice out of joy to gain what we have in heaven. Imagine what this man in the parable, he must have, people must have thought he was nuts. He's going and they don't know that there's a treasure in the field and he's not going to tell anyone because then they would go and do the same thing. So what he does instead is he's all of a sudden liquidating all his assets. He sells his house. He sells his car. He sells his business. He gets out of everything so that he can afford to buy this one field. Everybody, all his colleagues and his friends around him say, man, this guy must have gone crazy. He must have lost his mind. He's selling everything. Why are you doing this? And the guy's just thinking in the back of his mind, just wait. Just wait till you see this treasure that I'm getting. In the same way, when, when Christians have a taste of heaven, when they realize where they're headed, people around them may think that they're crazy. They're overzealous. They're out of their mind. What are they doing in this relentless pursuit of heaven? They're willing to give up everything if that's what it takes to follow Christ through those gates of heaven. Let's read then in verse 45 as Jesus tells another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and he sold everything that he had and he bought it. This parable is very similar, isn't it? That there's one thing that is so valuable that this guy's willing to, to sell everything, to sell the business, the house, the car, to even uh, do away with his, uh, his own income just to be able to purchase this one pearl. Same sort of thing. Heaven is very valuable, and, th and this, this illustrates that. But there's another aspect to this particular parable, and that is that in this case, the merchant in the parable is actually seeking pearls. The first case, there was just a guy, for all we know, just walking through a field and he stumbles upon a treasure that's hidden. In this case, though, there is a man who is actually seeking after pearls and he finds one more, more wonderful than he could have ever imagined. I think it teaches us something about those who pursue or those who end up in heaven, that there are those who uh, pursue it, who Many of us, in fact, being here today sort of gives in indicators of that, that religious people are always pursuing heaven. It's not just true of Christians, it's true of all religions. Some call it moksha or, nor or nirvana, the, the, that ultimate heavenly divine state. Human beings have it built into them, they always want it, and so good religious people will spend their life looking for it, like a merchant searching for fine pearls. There are other people who, um, who will be in heaven, but they're not necessarily in the pews here today because they're out there just sort of walking through the field. If you were to ask them, will you get into heaven? They say, well, I really don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever find heaven or not. And in fact, they may never find heaven unless they stumble upon a treasure. Maybe they stumble upon a relationship with you and you're able to share that treasure that you found. But the truth is that there will be people from both categories, those who uh, relentlessly pursue heaven, who are, who are religious people, and those who do not. Some of both groups will be in heaven, and some of both groups will not. Now you say, are, are you telling me that good religious people won't go to heaven? Absolutely I am. Not, not if they don't see Jesus as the treasure that he is. Not if they aren't prepared to change and possibly lose everything for the sake of following him and, and, and desire to, to, to know him as the ultimate treasure in life. If they're not willing to pursue Jesus as the surpassing joy, surpassing everything else in this life above everything. So the question that I, that I pose to you, you merchants seeking pearls today, are you willing to sell it all? Give it all up if it means growing close to Christ and his heaven. If, if you knew that God were calling you, saying, I want you to go sell everything, move to Africa, and share the gospel, 
Are you willing to do it? If you knew that he wanted you to plant a church, are you willing to do it? If you knew that he wanted you to just simply have a gospel conversation with your neighbor, are you willing to do it? And most of the time we say, well, but I'm not qualified or there's this particular circumstance, but every time we hear that hesitation, what we're really hearing is no, no, not really. Not really ready to give it all up. Now I can't, I can't get you ready to sell it all by guilting you into it, by saying, oh, well, you're, you should be ashamed. You're not ready to give everything up for Christ. It doesn't work that way. But, but the way that we get you ready to lay it all down is by lifting up Jesus, by letting you see he is surpassingly worthy and beautiful and everything else pales in comparison to knowing and, and having Christ. That he, the God of heaven and earth, the sovereign Lord became human to be close to you when you ran away from him. And that in addition to that, he died to pay the price for your sins. He bought you an absolute pardon on the cross. And that he rose from the dead to guarantee that you can be with him in the heaven he intended for you forever. That's the gospel. There's, that's the greatest news in the world and it's worth everything in the world combined. That's what this parable is teaching us. It's, it's worth selling everything. To follow Jesus and it won't be loss because you will have gained Christ and he's greater than it all let's continue then in verses 47 to 50 once again the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish and when it was full the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and then they sat down and they collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad away this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you remember two weeks ago, we, we covered a parable that's very similar to this one called the parable of the weeds. And it talked also about how at the end of the age, the angels would gather together the good, uh, the righteous and the wicked and it would separate them and throw the wicked into the fire. It uses the very same words, in fact, throws them into the fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a, a parable that reminds us that there are uh, wicked, evil things mixed in this world with the good and, and righteous things that we see. And that's true of all of our experience, isn't it? We've seen good in this world, but we've also seen some things that are very wrong. And, and this parable teaches us why. Because right now, the, all the fish are mixed in together, but at the end of the age, that net comes up. And then Christ separates the wicked from the righteous. It's interesting though, rather than um, Rather than just point out how this is very similar to the last one, notice where it falls in context to these parables. First, we see these two about how valuable and, and joyful and wonderful heaven is. And then in contrast, we see what judgment looks like. We, we see that there's not really a third option. I think a lot of people live their lives thinking that there's some sort of third option. They'll say, well, yeah, you know, I haven't given up everything to follow Jesus, maybe not, but you know what, I, I lived a good life and went to church. Is that enough? They didn't say that you had to give up everything to follow Jesus. But what Jesus is saying here is, are you willing? Are you willing to give up everything? Even, even maybe replace the word willing with eager. Can you pray that prayer? Lord, send me to Africa. Send me to Africa, Lord. And here's what's gonna happen most of the time. Most of the time the answer is going to be no. No, the Lord's planted you here for a particular reason. But can you pray that prayer with all honesty? Lord, I want to go. If it's what you want, send me to Africa or to Asia or to Iran, wherever, wherever the most dangerous place might be. Can you pray that prayer? As I said, most of the time the answer is going to come back no. But if you're willing, if you're eager to serve the Lord at all cost, then the Lord is going to do extraordinary things through your ordinary faithfulness right here in Wilmington. But there are only two options. There are those who are 100% in it with Jesus. And then there are those who are thrown into the fire. We see that contrast of these, these different parables here. Last verses we'll look at today, 51 and 52. 
Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. And he said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. So here's Jesus is talking about the disciples of the kingdom, which we are. We are the disciples of the kingdom of heaven. And what are we like? Well, he says we're like a, a householder who brings out of the store that which is new and that which is old. The, the, the most ancient of the church fathers have interpreted this as the, the old the law and the gospel or the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I, I'm not completely opposed to that. I think that you can hear that in, this, in these verses, but I go for a plainer meaning, I think. I want to go to a more simple understanding of this text. It says that he compares us to a householder. A householder and the owner of a house. And, and if you're the, house, the head of a household, you have a responsibility, don't you? Not just to yourself, to feed yourself. You have a responsibility as a head of household to feed those who are within your household, to make sure that there's provision for any sort of thing that might come up. And you're, you're able to uh, not just provide for food that day, but if you're, if you're at all capable or able, you begin to store that stuff up for the day when you might need it. Extra food, extra clothing. And Jesus says that the disciples of the kingdom are like these householders who are ready to bring out of the storeroom that which is new and that which is old. The traditions of the past that have significance and meaning, but yes, new application. But it's not, it's not just enough for us to experience the gospel. To come here on Sunday and sit and hear about the gospel and, and, ha, and think about how does that apply for me in my life. That's per, certainly possible and part of it. But you're a householder who has a responsibility to share this. That's why you have notes in your bulletin there. It says learn, then teach. That it's our obligation to bring out of everything that we have, not just to feed ourselves, but to begin to feed others with this gospel. He, Jesus tells these words to his disciples because it's going to be their responsibility when he's gone to spread this gospel throughout the world. It's gonna be their responsibility, their joy, to show people Jesus. That's the goal every time we preach, every time we listen to preaching, and is to see Jesus, and in seeing Jesus, to be transformed by him. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen.